What do these two cars have in common? This is a big family SUV. This, a smaller runaround. This is a petrol powered plug-in hybrid. This one, a standard petrol, no hybrid whatsoever. But they both feature a turbocharger. This JQ J7 has a 1.5 litre petrol engine, turbocharged, and this is the Ford 1 litre EcoBoost engine, also turbocharged. And they're great examples of how the turbo market has changed over the last few years. Once a mainstay of the performance sector, or mated to a diesel, today car makers are using turbos in smaller engines and vehicles would regularly need to boost power output, increase fuel efficiency, and make them greener and cleaner. But that does mean there are more turbo engines than ever on UK roads. And should they fail, it's the independent garage sector that's going to have to repair them. But just how have these modern engines changed the turbo market and made it more popular? And has it altered the turbocharger itself in any way at all? The turbo market in the UK is growing with manufacturers now imposing tighter emission controls. They're, they're tending to use smaller capacity engines. So to, to get that extra power, they, they're using turbochargers on, on most vehicles now. So the turbo market is definitely growing in the UK, uh, especially with the, um, after the, the age of the car park getting older as well. Turbocharging started becoming really popular with the Volkswagen PD engines. And the way that the engines have moved on since the early days of diesel turbocharging to, like you said, now to the PureTech and EcoBoost engines, where capacities are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So you can produce a, a 900cc engine now that can produce 120, 130 horsepower. So it can keep up with modern traffic it, and it can still produce those low emissions and improved economy that the market requires. The, the basic turbos remain the same. Um, ever since it was introduced. They've, they've added more um, features to the turbo, so you get things like um, variable nozzle technology. So the, the, the veins inside the turbo can open and close so that the vehicle boosts up quicker. But the basic turbo is, is, is remained the same. It's, it's basically just, a, just a, a shaft with a wheel on each end. So it sucks in the air, it compresses it, and it boosts the engine. So the basic philosophy of a turbo has remained the same. But do these cars, no matter what the powertrain type, put more strain on the turbo? With smaller sumps, warmer temperatures, and higher performance, are they increasing the likelihood of turbo failure? And how is the turbo coping under those pressures? What happened the last 10, 15 years, uh, the, the boost are going up, the temperature is going up, the RPM on the turbo is going up, the, the lifespan of a turbo is, uh, is a little bit limited uh, uh, because it's on so hard work and hard conditions. And we all know the service issue, you know, the, the, the car uh, fa factories want uh, to sell a car with high service intervals and cheap service in the beginning of the life and so on. And it's actually bad for the turbo. People don't think about it, but but a turbo use the engine oil, but the engine oil are normally changed in all times after 10 or 15,000 kilometer one year. Today is double up and sometimes it's two years, sometimes it's 30,000 kilometer. And on top of that, the, the oil are in not bad quality, but is more thin and a lower viscosity. So it actually means it cannot handle the same temperature but there's less friction in the oil. And why that? Yeah, the car manufacturer likes to sell the car with a great fuel consumption, and they need thin oil for that. But a turbo actually needs a better oil for heat uh, and so on. So the turbo is on hard work. So it's much more important now with a high quality turbo than for 10 years ago. It's much more higher temperature. It's both diesel and gasoline engines we're talking about here. I'd just like to take a quick time out to talk about our feature sponsor, Nissan's. Nissan's turbos offer high quality alternatives to OE and Reman products, all backed up by comprehensive tech support. Their range covers both passenger car and light commercial vehicle and features over 400 item numbers, 
covering over 4,300 OE product numbers and 67% of the vehicle park. You can find out how to boost your business with Nissan's by scanning the QR code on screen now or by visiting the web address below. The turbo is a complex component, but how long should it really last? And how can maintaining a vehicle help to ensure that a turbocharger itself does not fail? So a turbocharger is designed to last the life of the vehicle. If, it, if the vehicle is properly maintained with regular oil changes, then the, the turbocharger should last. The average age of a vehicle now is, is 10 to 12 years old. So a turbo should well outlive the, the life of the engine, if properly maintained. The, the engine picks up, the engine oil picks up debris. So you've got swarf, you've got um, soot in the engine. All of this debris passes through the turbocharger and this is what erodes the shaft of the turbocharger. Now cars like this JQJ7 are a great example of the diversity that turbochargers bring. A big family car like this, a big heavy car like this, with a 1.5 litre engine would have been unheard of years ago, but now it's possible. But that does mean the engine's under strain. So workshops need to be aware that as diverse as the market is, turbo failure is a potential. But what are some of the signs of turbo failure? And what do workshops need to know to make sure that they themselves are keeping the turbo in great condition? So this, the signs of a turbo failing are excessive smoke from the exhaust and noise, basically. The main cause is a failure of, of a turbocharger, like I said, oil contamination, and you've also got damage from foreign object as well. So you can suck in debris as well through the air intake, and that can also damage a turbocharger as well. A turbocharger can basically implode, it can destroy the exhaust, the catalytic the converter, DPF, but you can also get something called um, diesel runaway as well which that can basically just suck all the oil through the engine through the turbocharger then out through the exhaust and that can cause the engine to fail uh, the average turbocharger is several hundred pounds add that to the to the labor cost a, a turbo can take anything between two to eight hours to change i mean on some jaguar land rover uh, vehicles the body has to come off to change the turbocharger, particularly on Land Rovers. So it can be a very, very costly exercise. But just how vulnerable is the modern turbocharger in these new engine types? Today is a little different. Uh, we have already talked about the high temperature and, and the EGR valve uh, in itself is a very bad product for, for the turbo. Uh, you, we all know the EGR valve is not for, for us who like uh, the engine or life of engine is because of the nature. So it's two different things. It's good for, for the nature, but 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 only the engine, no. And the turbo, no. Um, th there's a lot of suit up building in engines today. Also because it's regenerate uh, uh, the DPF and send all the, the, the uh, some of the exhaust around the system uh, once more. And, and, and People don't think about it, but everything that's go out of an engine in one or other way needs to pass the turbo. If we're talking about the air or the or, or the engine breather system uh, or, or the exhaust, everything is passing the turbo in the compressor side of the turbo or the turbine side of the turbo or both sides. So you cannot leave the engine without uh, passing the turbo. So and 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 because all of these modern engines produce much more suit, uh, the, the turbo are, are more worn uh, 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 and it's compressor wheel. We see it on the compressor wheel. In, in old times, they were always gray and, and, and nice finish. But today, many of them are burned. And there's a lot of suit and carbon built up on, 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 the, on the compressor wheel. So, so that's totally different uh, compared for, 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 for five, 10 years ago. When is a turbocharger failure not a turbocharger failure? 
How easy is it for another problem in the system to diagnose itself as a turbo fault? But today it's so advanced uh, uh, management system uh, in a vehicle. So it can actually tell you it's a sensor failure on a turbo or actuator failure. But if the turbo not are controlled correctly, it shows the turbo have a failure, but it can be a wiring, it can be a vacuum hoses, uh, it can be the signal, uh, it can be so many things that actually uh, uh, are the problem. I can give you some examples. If the vacuum pump on, on the car not uh, produce uh, enough, enough vacuum, the, the turbo will not be controlled uh, correctly and, and people can actually change the turbo without finding the failure and it will come again. That's just one of the things. So today mechanics actually need to have a helicopter perspective uh, all over and check everything. If there is a leak in the intercooler, they need to, to find the leak because it can actually make a failure on the turbo, but it's a leak in the intercooler. Just a, a stone hit in the intercooler is enough. So the turbo market is bigger than ever. And with so many vehicles on the road now, plug-in hybrid or normal car featuring a turbo, your garage is probably going to be busier than ever when it comes to replacing them. But making sure that customers understand turbo care and maintenance and that a turbo failure could be expensive is also vital. It doesn't matter the type of car that comes in, the turbo market is growing and it's important to understand the technology.